Thanks. Welcome to our second and final talk of the day. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Raphael Clat, who will talk about pure states on operator algebras. Please take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, <clears throat> thank you to the uh, organizers for inviting me. It's an honor for me to be here. Um, So um, the basic question I want to uh, discuss today um, is a pretty uh, simple looking problem in, in C-star algebras, which uh, looks like this. So let's take B to be a unital C-star algebra. Okay, so everything in my talk is unital. Algebra, subspaces, maps, preserve, um, unit. Okay, so I'm not always, uh, not, I will rarely say it, but it's always implied. So we have a unital C-star algebra and we have a subspace. A, a unital subspace. Okay, and then I have a, a state on A, let's call it omega, which is pure. So omega is a pure state on A. So I remind you, a state is a unital contractive linear functional, and a pure state is just a state that's an extreme point of the convex set of all states. And then throughout my talk, I will, uh, I will use this property here. So let me make, make a definition. I'm going to say that uh, omega has the uh, unique extension property, <coughs> or UEP, if it admits a unique state extension to B. Okay, so by the hahn theorem, there's always, uh, there always is at least one state extension, uh, but the property asks for uh, there to be a unique one. Okay, and in fact, by uh, basic convexity theory, that is really the same property as requiring that there exists a unique, pure state extension to be. Okay, and here's the question. Um, is the UEP automatic for pure states on A. So we'll see in a few minutes why you might uh, ask this question, but uh, for the moment I want to point out that uh, this is not a very good question. Uh, because there's a trivial answer, uh, and it's trivially no, okay, so no. That's simply because if you're not careful, then, then it's very easy to make this fail. So intuitively speaking, if this unique extension property is automatic, then you expect some kind of rigidity between A and B, okay? There's somehow there's not that much room in between A and B because there's not that much um, flexibility in extending. But right now, I, I impose no size condition on A and B. So, so you can make this fail by doing this. I just take A to be the one-dimensional subspace spanned by the unit inside of B, and then, then you're doomed. Because uh, there's only one state here on A, and it is pure. And unless B is one-dimensional, there, there will be more than one state on B, and then it, the, the property fails. Okay, so um, this is why I said this, this question on qualified is not very good. And then uh, this is a kind of an un uninteresting example. What's really going, back, going wrong is that, uh, is that A is too small, okay? So really the question should be asking uh, whether the property is automatic if A is fairly large in B. Okay, and that will, that what, what that means precisely will, will depend on the context. Um, but uh, bef before getting into uh, kind of the, the new stuff, uh, I would like to um, remind you that this has been looked at before rather uh, famously by uh, Kattison and Singer. Um, so let me remind you of this uh, Kattison Singer stuff. So what uh, Kattison and Singer were interested in is exactly this question in the context where B is uh, B of H. Okay, hold on to the operators on the Hilbert space and A is a maximal abelian self-adjoint subalgebra. Okay, 
So here, wh what's the size condition that is being imposed? Well, it is that A is maximal abelian. Okay, so you're forcing it to be kind of big, you know, in a sense. And then you can ask this, this question. Is it true that all pure states on A admit a unique extension to B? And in their paper, uh, Kattison and Singer uh, prove something. They prove the following theorem, which uh, says that uh, when A is continuous, um, there are pure states on A uh, without the unique extension property. Okay, so what, what does continuous uh, mean here? Um, so you should think of a massa as uh, L infinity of some measure space, and uh, so continuous would mean something like A is uh, L infinity of the interval 0, 1 with respect to the bag measure acting on L2 of 0. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> for this type of massa, Kattison Singer showed that uh, there are pure states with um, more than one extension. And they do one more thing in their paper, which is ask a question. The problem is uh, what happens when, what happens when A is at the other extreme from being continuous, namely when it is discrete. Okay, so that would look something like little l infinity of the natural numbers acting on little l2. And that rather famously became known as the Kattison Singer problem. It was open for a very long time. And then in uh, 2015, this became a, a theorem. So uh, by uh, Marcus Spielman and uh, Srivastava. And what they show is that in this context, then the answer to the question is yes. Okay, so the unique extension property is automatic in that case. Okay, so UEP is automatic. Okay. So that's uh, this is just one one instance of this general problem that I uh, that I'm interested in, and uh, this is uh, kind of famous uh, famous developments. So I wanted to to mention this. Um, but really what I'm after today is uh, not quite uh, that. Um, it is, so today, so in this talk, in this talk I want to do something a bit uh, different. So um, I want to be looking at a less uh, structured A. Okay, so I stated this as a unital subspace, so let's stick with that generality for now. So A is just a subspace, a unital subspace. But of course we learned above that you should impose some size condition in order to avoid trivialities. And the way I will make sure that A is not too insignificant inside of B is by saying that uh, it generates B as a C-star algebra. Okay, so uh, it can't be too, too small. Okay, so that's the setting I'm uh, interested in today. So basically I want to try and sort of the question in this, in this context. Now, I want to make something very clear here. This is not a generalization of Kattis and Singer. That's at least their question. Okay, it's kind of a, both of them fit into the, under this umbrella here, but it's kind of disjoint, right? Because uh, this is not satisfied in the, in the context of Kattis and Singer. So these are kind of this joint problem that fit into the, the general one, but, but uh, yeah, so this is not a generalization. Okay, so that's the question I would like to understand. And uh, before um, <clears throat> proceeding, I would like to mention some kind of known answers um, uh, in, some, in some concrete cases. Okay, so here are some uh, examples or some uh, known results. Here's a list. So let's start in the uh, commutative context. So what happens when B is commutative? And when B is commutative, actually, the answer to the question is yes. Okay, so 
your states on any unital subspace have a unique extension. And in fact, uh, to me at least, this is what motivates the asking the question in the first place. I mean, if you read Katterson and Singer's paper, they have some kind of, they, they claim that this is, uh, mo for them, it's motivated by some physical interpretation. I'm not exactly sure what they have in mind when they say this, but uh, at least you can um, look at the commutative setting and you realize that the answer is yes, why? That's actually very, uh, very simple. This is simply because um, in the commutative setting, so when B is commutative, pure states on B are the same thing as irreducible star representations. So irreducible star representations. In particular, they're multiplicative, okay? So a pure state on B is then uniquely determined by what it does to A because of this property here, okay? And then you look at the question and it's really asking whether or not there's a unique pure state that agrees with, uh, with a given state on A. And, and because of this multiplicativity uh, property, then, then you see that this is always true. Okay, so commutative situation is easily understood. So, so let's step in the non-commutative world and see what happens. So let's take this one step at a time. What if uh, I have the two by two matrices? Okay. In that case, um, the answer is still yes. In other words, the property is automatic for pure states. And uh, the only proof I know of this is just a uh, rather unpleasant calculation. So this is something I carried out a few summers ago with um, two undergraduate students, Jason Ball and Colin Crisco um, at the University of Manitoba. And uh, as it turns out, unbeknownst to me, Jason now goes to the University of Waterloo and he's here somewhere today. So. They didn't even know this, but anyway, he's, the, he's in the room. So this is what happens for two by two uh, matrices. And then of course you ask yourself what happens for n by n matrices. Now, I don't know how, how the question came across to you, but, but uh, to me, it sounds like a very unlikely property okay, that everything should extend uniquely. So you might expect that there should be a counterexample. And indeed there is a counterexample in the n by n matrices. You only have to go to four by four matrices to see this. Um, no, so this is not automatic in this case. So there are pure states on unital subspaces that do not admit a unique extension to M4. Um, it's not so easy to write down an example here. So the first place where I learned of this is in an email with uh, David Sherman. So he constructed such a thing. So he asked the same, he asked himself the same question and figured it out, uh, I don't know how many, how many years ago at some point. And then uh, uh, anyway, so he told me about this. And then very recently, there was a preprint posted on the archive by uh, Ken Davidson and Michael Hartz, where they uh, look at a slightly different question. But in there, there is an example that does exactly this in the four by four matrices. Okay? And I just want to acknowledge that uh, their example is, is based on some uh, fairly extensive body of literature in linear algebra that asks similar questions. And, and there's many people involved in this, but there's uh, one name that keeps recurring. And, this is uh, Ilyas Pitkovsky, so I should acknowledge that uh, Ilyas Pitkovsky has done lots of stuff about this around the 2015 or so. Okay, <clears throat> and there's two more things I wanna, two more uh, concrete instances I wanna discuss here where the answer is still yes. So surprisingly enough, uh, the answer is yes um, when the following is true. So the answer is yes if so I'm gonna write lots of words here that may not be familiar to you. I will explain after I promise. So this is true if the so-called matrix state space. Oh, maybe this is too low. Can you guys see this? It's getting borderline. Okay, I, I, will, I will stop. Okay. <laughs> uh, the matrix state, state space of A is a uh, symmetric free spectrohedron. Okay, I'll tell you in a second what these words mean, but uh, th so this is work of uh, a consequence of some work of Evert, Elton, Platt, and McCullough. So these, uh, these people were uh, interested in matrix convexity and this is a consequence of what they've done. So now let me define this if you've never seen uh, what, what, what this stuff uh, is. So what's a free spectrohedron? 
Uh, so it's uh, something, so the data here is, is a given tuple of matrices. Okay, so this is saying that there exist finitely many self-adjoint matrices of some, some size D, say, self-adjoint. And then what's a free spectrohedron that, what's the free spectrohedron that this stuff determines? Then it's a, it's a sequence of sets, okay? One in every, uh, one for every N. And at the level N, this is what the set looks like. So at level N, the elements of the free spectrohedron that this determines are those G tuples of self-adjoint N by N matrices that satisfy some kind of matrix inequality. Okay, so this is, roughly speaking, some kind of non-commutative generalization of a polyhedron. So that's what a free spectrohedron is. The statement that the matrix state space of A should be something like this is simply saying that for every N, so such that for every N, the set of unital completely contractive maps from A into MN is given by the nth level of the free spectrohedron. Okay, so this is kind of, this is a kind of a restriction on A. And, uh, but when you have this, um, this property, then, then the unique expression property is automatic. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you what that means here, symmetric. It's a small technical condition that needs to be there, but um, it's not overly important. Okay, and one last um, instance where the answer is known is that this you can just do by hand. So this is true for, so this is, the answer is yes, for instance, if you take A to the, the uh, Unital subspace spanned by the uh, creation operators. On the full Fox space over CD. Okay, so somehow you use their properties, you, you do a, a concrete uh, calculation and then you can prove that this always works. Okay, now <clears throat> I don't view this list as uh, uh, very uh, satisfactory. Because um, what I'm really after is, is to, I want to try to understand this question using some kind of structure, okay? I want to know, uh, you know, when it's yet, when the answer is yes, why is it yes? And when the answer is no, why is it no? And I don't want to just a piecemeal list of things that work or don't work, okay? So that's really what I want to do today. And uh, to get this done, I will draw uh, inspiration from um, past work of uh, some people that uh, looked at a slightly more structured uh, situation that I, that I am dealing with. And the first, the first, uh, first uh, source of inspiration is work of uh, Anderson. So here's the theorem of Anderson from 1979. So as far as I can tell, Anderson was very interested in the Cadison Singer problem that was still open at the time, of course, and he decided to attack this problem uh, by considering something more uh, general, which is. Uh, Basically, the question that's over there, but in the case of where A is a C star subalgebra. Okay, so we have a C star subalgebra, A inside of B. Um, we have a pure state omega on A. And let's say that we pick one pure extension of omega to B. I'm going to call this one big omega. Okay, so this is a pure state extension. And then, uh, now we know, we know that unless you impose some kind of size condition on A and B, then there's no uh, way that you can expect the unique expression property to hold all the time. But what Anderson did was kind of different. He characterized when the property holds. Okay, so here's the statement. So then, omega has the unique extension property if and only if. Um, the pure state extension, capital Omega, has what uh, nowadays is called an excision. So it has an excision in A. Okay, so some of you may be familiar with the notion of excision. Sometimes it's used in C star algebra uh, theory. Uh, I'm going to give the definition. I just want to point out that if you know what that is, uh, let me emphasize there's a difference here is that I want the excision to be in A. Okay, so there's an extra requirement. The excision, should, the excision should lie in the small C star algebra. Now let me write the definition here. So this says that, so what's an excision? An excision is a, is a net, it's a contractive net. So this is a contractive net. We call it E lambda. 
in A. Okay, so that's the in A part. It just has to be in A. Now, wh what makes the next decision? So it has two properties relative to omega. First of all, along the net, omega tends to 1. Okay? And the second property is that if you take um, E lambda star, you multiply this by B minus omega of B times B identity, E lambda, then this tends to 0 for every B in the C star algebra. Okay, so what's the intuition here? is that this net excises the state capital omega from the state space, okay? So, uh, yes, sorry? Pardon me? No, no. Okay, so, so, so yeah, so the intuition here is that uh, somehow this... Sorry, the question was just, does A have to be abelian? Yes. The answer, my answer was no. Um, okay, so in the limit somehow, uh, the only thing that matters is the value of omega, okay? So you take an any b in the C star algebra, in the big guy, multiply it on the left and on the right, take a limit, then you see that this is the same thing as basically a scalar multiple of the identity, um, namely the value of capital omega. Okay, so, um, so this is nice, right? Because it, it gives you a, a characterization of the UEP and uh, now, if you look at the definition here of having an excision, you realize that uh, the fact that A is a C star subalgebra does not really matter, okay? So you could imagine that perhaps something of that sort could be true in the generality that I'm, that I'm after um, over here. Okay, so that's one, one hint, and we'll keep it, keep it in mind. And then there's the second, second uh, uh, result that I want to draw inspiration from, and this one is due to Bishop. It's a much older result. which applies in the commutative uh, setting, okay? So here I will uh, take B to be a, a separable commutative unital C star algebra, okay? And A will be a bit uh, more structured than just a unital subspace. It will be a unital norm-closed subalgebra, okay? So subalgebra, just means closer to the product, okay? Not necessarily self-adjoint. Okay, and then uh, then we have the same um, then we have the same um, same same notation as above. So we have um, a pure state little omega on A. Then we have capital omega, <coughs> some pure state extension to B. Okay. And uh, what Bishop does is give yet another characterization of when little omega has the unique extension property. The statement is this, omega has the unique extension property if and only if something very special holds about capital omega. So um, let me point out one more time that pure states on commutative C star algebras are the same as irreducible star representations, which are the same as point evaluation, right? So B is C of X for a compact metric space, because I'm, everything's separable here, which means that uh, omega looks like evaluation at some point in the domain. And what Bishop says is that little omega has the UEP precisely when little x is what is known as a peak point. Okay, which means the following, which means that there exists a function in the subalgebra which um, <clears throat> satisfies the following with norm one, which, uh, whose modulus takes the value one at x, and outside of the point x, the modulus is strictly less than one. Okay, so, so if you've never really thought about this stuff or have seen this, let me just draw a picture. So this is requiring that in the subalgebra, there should be a function whose modulus looks something like this. Okay, it, it maximizes at x and nowhere else. All right. 
And so again, this is attractive because it characterizes the UEP. And then perhaps you can imagine that there is some non-commutative interpretation of being a peak point that could be uh, related to, to the general problem that, I, that I'm asking. Okay. So, uh, so this is, these are the two sources of uh, inspiration going forward. And uh, I, will, I would like to spend a bit of time telling you about the main ingredients in the proof of Bishop's theorem, because they will uh, play a role in, in what follows. Okay, so here's, here's an outline, of the outline. It's more just a list of ingredients in the proof of uh, Bishop's theorem. <coughs> and the first one is the most important, and I will call this Bishop's criterion. And uh, so here it is. It says that there exists a number alpha between 0 and 1 with the following property, that uh, whenever you take a compact set in the domain, okay, in the set x, which does not contain the point little x, then you can find a function a in the subalgebra, um, which is uh, somewhat peaking, but not quite, okay? Such that, um, such that the modulus of A at the point of interest is one, okay, this is good. Normally we would want the norm of the function to be at most one or equal to one, and this is saying, well, it's not much bigger than one. And normally we would like, um, again, the analogy is not so clear here, but and then the, the third requirement is that on the given compact set, you're uh, not too big, okay? You're dominated un uniformly by alpha. Okay, so this may look a bit, a bit strange, uh, but one thing that hopefully is, is uh, pretty clear is that this is uh, weaker than being peaking, right? So if you want a picture, um, you know, we have our points, we have a given compact set here. There's a number of alpha, and then the requirement is that, uh, well, there's a function whose modulus takes the value one here. On the set, it shouldn't be too big, but then you're allowed to be a bit bigger than one elsewhere, too. Like, it could look something like this, okay? So that's, you know, that's not quite as good as this. It's getting there somehow, but it's not quite as good. Yet, um, here's a miracle, so the miracle is that uh, x is a peak point, an a peak point, if and only if the criterion holds for some alpha. So that's quite hard to believe uh, just because of the pictures, but um, so here's roughly speaking how Bishop does this. So we're in a compact metric space, so then what you do is you write the complement of the point as an increasing union of compact sets, okay? Kn, say. Then you take Kn, you apply the criterion, you get a function An that does this, okay? It's not quite good enough, it has some flaws. And then you go to Kn plus one, you get another function, but then you rig things so that An plus one fixes a little bit of the flaws of the previous guy, okay? And then you take a big geometric sum at the end and then, uh, quite miraculously, uh, everything goes away and then you actually get a peak point, okay? So this is actually a very, very important uh, theorem of, of uh, Bishop that, that you can do this. And just some foreshadowing here, I want to emphasize that this uses, crucially, that we have a compact metric space. All right, now, of course, that's quite useful. This is a much easier property to, to uh, verify in principle. And then, uh, so how does the proof uh, go from here? So the next step is just that this is easy to do if at your disposal you have all continuous functions, okay? And being a peak point is, is a restriction because you want the function to be in the subalgebra. But if you have at your disposal all continuous functions, that's not an issue whatsoever. So you can certainly do this. Give me the setup, a compact set. If you give me an alpha, then I can certainly do this with a continuous function, for instance. So I can find a continuous function. So in other words, I can find an element in B, in the big guy, that does this. But of course, that's not good enough. It's not in A. So now you have to massage this so that it applies in A. So, and here's the, um, the key idea. 
And I think this is an important step because uh, it might not be so clear to you how you're ever supposed to leverage the unique extension property to do anything, okay? It looks like a kind of a hard property to um, get your, your hands on. And, and the um, answer is that it can be reformulated analytically by using a basic idea that uh, most of you may have seen in, in functional analysis, which is the proof of the hahn banach theorem. So if you dig in your memory, you might remember that in the proof of this, usually there's a lemma, an elementary lemma, that involves proving something like some kind of supremum is less than some kind of infimum, okay? Then you pick a point in that interval and that parameterizes all the extensions. This interval parameterizes all the extensions. So if you want to have only one extension, then some soup must be equal to some inf. Okay, and this is what I'm gonna write here. Okay, so um, the unique extension property, this is what it buys you here. It tells you this, that the supremum of, over the, of the um, real part of omega of A, where A is an A, and the real part of A is at most the log of this guy. So normally, this would be equal to the infimum of uh, over a bunch of extensions of which there on, there's only one here. So by the unique extension property, we get that this is equal to this quantity. Okay, and then uh, the last step is simply you pick an element, let's say A0 that approximates the supremum here and you exponentiate. Okay, and then you have to check a bunch of things, okay? But you can see that this is why I took a log here. Then I will have, uh, you know, what's the modulus of such a thing? The modulus of an exponential is the exponential of the real part, which I have control over. So it's all set up to, to work out somehow. Okay, there's some th something to check here, but this is the element that will end up um, satisfying Bishop's criteria. And notice, uh, notice that uh, I, I'm, Change the setup a little bit here, right? I, I required that I had a norm closed subalgebra, and you can see why at the very end. Okay, the a zero that you get is an a, but then you you take the exponential and you want to remain an a, so you better be closed on the products and closed under norm as well. Okay, so so why am I telling you all of this? Again, the point was to try to draw inspiration from these two theorems. This is just for for um, later purposes. Okay, so based on these two theorems, uh, what's the question then for today? The, the very concrete question I would like to, to address. So the question becomes the following. Okay, so let me repeat what the setup is. So we have a unital sister algebra. I'm gonna specialize a tiny bit and go from subspaces to subalgebras. Already uh, we saw that Bishop needed it and it Somehow you get better results in that case. So let's take, just like Bishop, a norm closed subalgebra. We are in a non commutative context now, but nevertheless, let's do this. And then uh, again, we have omega, pure state on A, and we have some pure state extension. To B. And then uh, there's three properties floating around right now, okay? The first one is, is the one that I'm after, which is that omega has the unique extension property. And then uh, what else? We have excision, right? Anderson gave us this idea that perhaps excision has to, excision has to, to do with this in, in some way. So uh, let's, let's try to just copy this. Omega has an excision in A. And the third property is some kind of peaking phenomenon. Okay, so omega is an A peak state. Okay, and I'm being a bit vague here because we have to be careful what, what that means, but I'll be more careful when, when we get to it. And the question is, are there connections between these? Are these related at all in general? So are these related? And my point will be that they are, okay? I will now uh, tell you about some, some results that show that indeed there are some, some connections here. Uh, again, outside of the commutative rule. So, um, so here's the, the first theorem I wanted to mention today. Okay, so this will be the setup um, going forward. 
So the theorem is, is this, is that, um, uh, how should I state this? Okay, so property, uh, write it like this. So first property is uh, that um, omega has an excision in A. Okay. This is equivalent to some kind of peaking property, which I will write in a second, which in turn implies uh, the unique extension property. Okay, so what's the peaking property? Um, there will be some undefined terms here, so just give me uh, one moment, I will tell you what they are. So the peaking condition is that the so-called left support projection of omega is an a peak projection. Okay, so that's the statement. And now what, uh, I need to define what, what that, that is for you. Okay, so um, there's a few things here. Let's consider what is uh, sometimes called the left kernel of the state omega. Okay, so this is all the elements C in the second dual of B, such that omega of C star, C star C is zero. Okay, so when you have a C star algebra, the second dual is of one moment algebra. This is a weak star closed left ideal, so it's generated by a projection. Okay, so it's a principal ideal. So it looks like V star star times a projection, and the orthogonal complement of that projection is what I call L omega, little L omega. All right. So this is the meaning of the symbol little l omega. Now, saying that it's an A peak projection means this. Um, so l omega is an A peak projection. It means that there is a contraction in the subalgebra A. Um, let me just write it and give you the intuition after. Okay, so this will be. A times the projection is equal to the projection. And if you take a state C and you evaluate it at A star A, you get something strictly less than one if C of the support projection is zero. Okay, so why am I talking about projections all of a sudden? This was supposed to be an you know, analog of being a peak point. The analogy is as follows, okay? So in the commutative setting, we have a point. We discuss peak points, but we don't have points here. So what you do is this, is that you identify a point X with its indicator function, okay? Now the indicator function is not continuous, but it's something in the second dual of the continuous functions, okay? So in other words, the points become projections in this analogy, and then you can make a peaking type definition for, for projections. So this is roughly speaking saying that the contraction takes the value one at your point, and this is roughly speaking saying that it takes the value, value less than one outside of the point. And this is the definition due to Damon Hay of 2007. Okay, so that's the statement of the theorem. I'm not gonna tell you very much about the proof. I just wanna tell you about some of the uh, ingredients, once again, because it uses some important work of other people, which I would like to acknowledge. Um, Okay, so the difficult implication here is, uh, is this. Okay, so let me ex try to explain this, this implication. So the goal, the ultimate goal is to establish that our pure state extension admits an excision in A. Now, um, there's a, that's a paper, there's an old paper of uh, Ackerman, Anderson, and Pedersen. From 1986, where they show a bunch of things, but what, one thing that they show is that pure states on C star algebras always have excisions. Okay, forget some algebras here. If you just have one C star algebra, one pure state, there's always an excision. And the way they prove this is, uh, is uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, simple once you make the following observation that when you have a pure state such as, such as capital omega, it has the following property that its kernel its kernel is, can be written as um, the left kernel intersect the C star algebra plus the adjoint of this object. 
Okay. Now, why is this useful? It is because this is a uh, norm-closed left ideal in the C-star algebra. Norm-closed left ideals admit right contractive approximate units. Okay. So that's a contractive net, and this is the excision. Okay. So you just take a right contractive approximate unit for this left ideal, and then you check that this is the excision that you're after. Okay, but that's not good enough for us, of course, because we want this section to, to be an A. And when you do this, you just get something in B. How do you push it down into the subalgebra? This is where the peaking condition enters the picture. This requires some difficult uh, theorem, theorems of uh, Damon Hay and uh, Charles Reed, which allow, allow you to, um, to push the, the contractive approximate unit in A. Okay, so get the uh, contractive approximate identity in A. Okay, so that's roughly speaking how the difficult implication goes. The, the peaking condition is used to push down the contractive approximate identity, and that is what the excision uh, will be. Okay. So now this theorem isn't perfect because, uh, because in fact, the, the missing implication here is, no, is known not to hold. Okay, and that's a bit annoying because that's saying that bishops beautiful theorem uh, does not seem to carry over, okay? And I would like to try to fix this. So I have 10 minutes, Karen, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so let me tell you about an attempt to um, recover Bishop's theorem. Um, okay. okay, so the question is whether we can recover some kind of peaking from the UEP. So um, the statement will look like this. Again, there will be three properties. I will we'll establish some implication between them. So uh, here's the peaking type um, property that I can establish. So um, this should be compared uh, live as I write it with Bishop's criteria. Okay, it's gonna look a, a little strange otherwise, but please try to compare this uh, side by side with this criteria. And okay, so what I can prove is this is that for every alpha between zero and one, okay, so far so good, there is, for every compact set K in the state space of the C-star algebra, which does not contain the state of interest, okay, that seems to make sense. There exists an element A in the subalgebra such that, okay, now, um, the analogy here is that points become pure states, or points become states, okay? So the first condition is that A should take the value one at the point X. Okay, so you can do that. And that's kind of saying something similar. Next condition should be that the norm of A is not too much bigger than one. Fine, and then the third property, um, well, it's not quite as good. So third property is that if you take a state C in your compact sets is compact, sorry, compact. If you take a state C in K and you evaluate it at A star A, then you like get something strictly less than one, okay? But the point is that uh, there is no uniform control here. Okay, it's less than one, but not less than alpha. Okay, so again, so this, Hopefully, you will agree with me, it looks a little bit like Bishop's criterion, but there is a, there's a flaw here. You don't get alpha, you get one. Okay, so uh, in, in the paper I give this, uh, so, so this looks a bit weaker than Bishop's criterion, which is genuine peaking. So I, I was trying to figure out some kind of uh, appropriate name for this. Uh, so then I uh, spent five minutes Googling about mountaineering to find something which is not a peak, but which is some kind of, uh, and I came up with Pinnacle. And I was like, who will ever uh, you know, argue with me about this? But then, I don't know if he's here today, but Stuart White was here yesterday, and then I had this, oh, there he is, oh my God, he's here. So <laughs> then I had this like <laughs> panic moment that like I might have uh, you know, upset him. But anyway, so I simply won't, won't give this a name. But uh, so somehow this is a bit less than peaking in my, in my views, and, and, um, but it's, it's getting there, okay? Okay, and then, uh, of course, uh, then you can ask about the converse, right? This looks a bit weaker than you might like, but then you can ask about the converse. And the converse uh, is known to fail, but there's kind of a partial converse, which is that um, 
you can see that this in turn implies that the, um, the GNS representation of this state, let me call it maybe sigma omega, this has the unique extension property, okay? So for those of you familiar with this stuff, um, this, so this is really saying that sigma omega has, is a boundary representation for A. So you may have heard about this before in trying to construct a C star envelope an operator system, Arvison had this magnificent vision that involved finding these boundary representations, okay? And the condition is very similar to what it is for a state except that you don't have a state, okay? But anyway, you can kind of recover some amount of unique extension from it. And I think this is interesting for the following reason, because once again, may, maybe you, you find this not uh, completely satisfactory because of this, of this flaw here, but in the commutative setting, this carries the same, uh, this is, the, this is of the, the, exactly the same strength as usual peaking, okay? And that is because of this last implication here. Okay, so not, not everything is terrible here. Um, perhaps you would want an alpha, but at least in the commutative setting, you recover the, the usual. Okay, so I have just five minutes. I, I, there was one more result I wanted to tell you about. I think I'm just gonna tell you, uh, roughly speaking, what I wanted to say. So, so then you might ask yourself, why, why do you not get alpha here? What's the problem? Okay, what's the proof of this? Well, the proof of this is very similar to what I wrote here. Is this kind of the rough outline? You wanna kind of uh, carry these things over. But then eventually, so the, here's the difficulty in the proof. Is that you have a state C and then you're trying to bound from above an expression of that sort, e to the alpha star e to the alpha. Okay, now in the commutative setting, even a pure state C same, the commutative setting, a pure state would be multiplicative. You can split everything apart. You would get the norm, the modulus squared of the exponential and you could estimate away happily. But here you're stuck. You're stuck because this is just the state, okay? So this kind of explains the technical difficulties in, in getting this, uh, this uh, less desirable one. But then you could say that this difficulty is entirely my fault, okay? Because um, this is an analogy, right? I, I replace the points from the commutative setting by pure states. Pure states tend to, well, they're not multiplicative in general. But then you should, then you could say, well, this, because you chose the wrong analogy, right? Look at this here. The pure states are the same as irreducible star representations in the commutative setting. So perhaps what I should have done is taken the analogy to be a point becomes an irreducible star representation here, star representation, right? And then, you know, this, this problem I have here would not occur. You could just split everything if you have a star representation, and then perhaps the estimate would be easier. And you can do something like this, but then there's a price to pay, okay? There's a, of course, everything's multiplicative. It looks way more attractive, but what, what, the, what the price is is that the space you're dealing with now is not the, the state space. It's not this. Okay. So this is, in a separable setting, this is a compact metric space. Okay, so it's very nice. If you decide to replace states by representations, you're dealing with what? You're dealing with the spectrum of the C star algebra. Okay, so the collection of uh, unitary equivalence classes of irreducible star representations. There is a topology on there. It's a bit wacky. Um, it is somewhat compact. Okay, it has the right property with respect to open covers. But one thing, okay, and it's also second countable with separability, so somehow you're getting close to compact metric space, but you don't have Hausdorff. Typically, you don't have Hausdorff. The spectrum of a C-star algebra is typically not Hausdorff. It's a very strong condition if it is, um, which makes, uh, so I could write a result here, but it's, it's a bit unwieldy exactly because of this, and, and uh, there's a kind of technical difficulties, but ultimately I can get a conclusion that looks very much like Bishop's criterion, and then you get excited, you say, well, can you reproduce Bishop's miracle? Can you replace this criterion by a much neater looking peaking condition? And the answer is, well, you almost can, but then you get stuck because you don't have Hausdorff, okay? So anyway, I'm gonna stop here, thank you very much. <laughs>